This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. Hi there, welcome to Up and Atom. I'm Jade. I'm in France at the moment and I often use Google Translate to convert stuff I want to say in English into French. This got me thinking, does Google Translate no French. If I wanted to translate an English sentence into French, I would first need to look up the French words in a dictionary and make sure they had the same meaning as the words in English. I would need the rules of grammar to let me know how the sentence should be constructed. It would take a lot of time and effort, but in the end, I would be pretty confident that what I want to say is being conveyed. Veux-tu être mon ami? But this isn't how Google Translate works. Computer programmers have loaded the AI with a huge number of samples of about 80 languages. It also scans millions of documents on the internet to determine how words or sentences in one language are translated into another. For example, Google Translate scans pages and pages of text to determine what friend is usually translated as in French. It doesn't know the meaning of the word. It just uses statistics. This made me wonder, what does it actually mean to know something? Turns out I'm not the first person who ever wondered this. The same question has been pondered by philosophers for at least 2000 years. One of the first philosophers to think about knowledge is Plato, who lived in ancient Greece. In his dialogue, The Aetetus, Plato explores a definition of knowledge that seems to capture what we usually mean when we say that we know something. One way this definition comes out is true belief with an account or rational explanation. Some version of that definition has survived through the centuries to today and is usually worded as justified true belief. Let's step back and think about this three-part definition. Knowledge is a belief. That is something happening in your mind. You have a view or opinion about something. That belief is true. For a belief to count as knowledge, it must reflect accurately what's happening in the world. If I believe that the moon is made of cheese, that belief does not count as knowledge. The belief must be justified. That is, you must have come to the belief because you had a reason, whether evidence or experience or testimony or something else. Let's explore this definition with an example. If I say that I know a sheep is in the field, there must be three things going on for me to have knowledge. First, I must believe that a sheep is in the field. Second, a sheep must actually be in the field. And finally, I must have formed my belief by looking outside and seeing a sheep or hearing a sheep or something like that. That last step is crucial because it ensures that knowledge can't just be a lucky guess. If I were in my house and I couldn't see outside and my friend asked me, is there anything in the field? And I just guessed a sheep and there was one. You wouldn't say that I knew there was a sheep in the field. You would say that I just had landed on the right answer by accident. That for my belief to count as knowledge, there would have to be something connecting my belief to the world, something that caused my belief. This seems like a pretty solid definition of what it means to know something. And for a long time, the justified true belief definition was well accepted among philosophers of knowledge. Then about 60 years ago, an American philosopher named Edmund Gettier found some cracks in the definition. Now there was trouble. Gettier showed that a belief can be both true and justified and still not count as knowledge. What if when you looked outside, you were actually seeing a woolly dog that just looked a lot like a sheep? And then what if, unbeknownst to you, a sheep was indeed in the field but out of sight in some bushes. It sounds contrived, but this case of the sheep and the woolly dog shows how the traditional definition of knowledge is not airtight. We seem to have met all the criteria for knowledge. You believe there's a sheep in the field, there is a sheep in the field, and you have good reason to believe that a sheep is in the field. But according to Gettier, you still don't know there's a sheep in the field. Your belief was founded on a mistake and is only true by coincidence. There is no link between your true belief and the sheep in the field. In fact, the problem that Gettier spotted was identified over a thousand years earlier by Dharmatora. 
a Buddhist philosopher who lived in what is now Pakistan. In Dharmatora's example, a person sees what looks like smoke rising in the distance. He thinks that someone must have built a fire, but actually it's just a cloud of flies hovering above some food. However, just over the next hill, someone has built a fire and is starting to cook a meal, but the fire has just been lit, so there's no smoke yet. The person believes that someone has started a fire, someone has started a fire, and the person has good reason to believe that someone has started a fire since he saw what looked like smoke. But it wasn't smoke, so he was correct, but only by chance. Dharmatara posed another example. A person is walking in a desert and sees what she thinks is a pool of water in the distance. When she gets closer, she sees that she had been looking at a mirage. There was no pool of water after all. But at the same time, there's a well hidden under a pile of rocks. So the person's belief that there was water in the distance was true. It was also based on a good reason, the mirage. But in reality, her belief was lucky. She had no idea that the well was there. Problems like these are called Getia problems. Even though Getia's original article was only two and a half pages long, it sparked a period of new and exciting energy among philosophers, as it showed that the traditional definition of knowledge wasn't quite right. Philosophers quickly set about trying to mend these cracks by coming up with new airtight theories of knowledge. Now, before we talk about what these theories were, it's worth asking, why should we care? Gettier cases are rare. Most of the time, the justified true belief definition works just fine. Is it really that big a deal? Well, from a practical standpoint, as artificial intelligence becomes more advanced, the question of what exactly counts as knowledge becomes more and more pressing. There'll be more about this later on in the video, but for the moment, I want to talk about the philosophical reasons this question is important. Knowledge is the only way we know of getting at the truth. The analysis of knowledge aims to uncover exactly what this getting at consists of. Philosophers of knowledge or epistemologists want to understand knowledge in all of its possible, possible ways and manifestations. To do that, we need a rigorous airtight definition of what it means and what it takes to know something. We thought we had one, but Getia showed us that that wasn't true. Something is missing in the definition, and if we can't find out what that something is, we don't really understand the nature of knowledge. So how do we solve this problem? How do we stop getting gettied? This is still an open question, and there's no general agreement on the solution, but several people have made attempts. The main tactic has been to take the justified true belief definition and add another condition. Philosopher Alvin Goodman proposed that for a justified true belief to count as knowledge, the belief must have a causal connection to the thing the belief is about. In Dharmatara's example, the belief that there was a fire over the next hill was not caused by there actually being a fire. It was caused by flies, which were attracted to the food. According to Goodman, that's why the belief does not count as knowledge. <sighs> Another option is specifying that a true belief counts as knowledge only if it isn't true because of some accident or luck. This proposal seems to address one of the vulnerabilities exposed by Getier, but it then leads to the problem of what exactly counts as luck. Maybe luck is common and Getier examples just involve too much luck. It's hard to say. This proposal just seems to add another layer of difficulty. Yet another proposal focuses on making sure that you don't overlook possibilities or facts that could make you reconsider whether you in fact know something. So if you're trekking in a desert and you think you see a pool of water in the distance, you ought to take into account the possibility that you are seeing a mirage, which would make sense since you're in the desert. But this option doesn't seem very practical as it's impossible to know every single thing about every situation you're in. So is it even possible to ever know anything? What does that mean and what exactly counts as knowledge? These questions are becoming more and more pressing as artificial intelligence progresses. Recent artificial intelligence programs are now able to predict the motion of planets accurately without having Newton's laws of motion programmed into them. In science, we usually expect that scientists gather data, come up with a theory or law that describes that data, and then test that theory on new data. But these programs don't do that. 
Instead, scientists just feed data about planet motions into the computer program. The machine doesn't try to formulate a law of nature or deeper meaning behind the data, but it can still make accurate predictions based on the input data alone. So while we might be able to say that by deriving his laws, Newton knew something about the way the universe works, can we say the same thing about the artificial intelligence programs? They can sift through data and make accurate predictions, but do their predictions count as knowledge? And what about knowledge that isn't so scientific, like poetry, art, and music? AIs can now make music, write song lyrics and stories, but do they actually know what they're doing? Could they ever be as good as humans at these extremely human activities? Well, you can be the judge of that. In 2016, scientists got an AI to write an entire musical. The AI wrote the story, the music, the lyrics. It took months, but the musical was actually performed in London's West End with actors and everything. The whole process was filmed and made into a documentary called Can a Computer Write a Hit Musical, which you can watch for free on CuriosityStream. I have to say this is actually one of the best documentaries I've seen in a while. It's entertaining and you learn so much about the machine learning process. How much data the AI needs, how it learns and teaches itself skills like writing music and lyrics, how close and how far they are from getting it right. This is just one of thousands of documentaries on CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream are currently offering my streaming service Nebula completely free when you sign up with them. Nebula is a streaming platform made by a bunch of us educational YouTube creators where we can explore making different and experimental content. It's been nominated for a Streamy Award, which is cool. I've made a feature film on there called Is Math Invented or Discovered, which you can check out if you like. There's a promotion going on right now where you get a 26% discount off the bundle. So that's two streaming services for just $14.80 for a year. Sign up with the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash upandatom and start discovering today. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!